saying, and thank you so much for this wonderful invitation. It's, it's fantastic to be here. And uh, I'm going to make an executive decision and say a big Dankeschön to Sonny and, uh, and to all of the sound people and all the other guys, and for all of you lot. For coming, for coming along and speaking such embarrassingly good English, which is probably even better than most of ours. So, uh, so a big thank you so much um, for, for all of that. Um, one constructive piece of advice for next year. Um, I'm a volcanologist. I'm used to volcanic explosions. I'm a lot less used to Bavarian thunderstorms. So as our, as our plane was coming in from the UK to land yesterday, the turbulence was so great, I thought a wing was going to pop off. So maybe next year, someone needs to cancel the thunderstorms. But thank you, nonetheless. And can I have that minute back, please, for that nice thanks that I gave? OK, so here, oh, that, that was a negative. OK, so um, thank you very much. I'm going to speak on explosive adventures on volcanoes. In particular, I'll talk about what I do, namely studying these things here, volcanic gases. Here are some being released from Mount Etna in Sicily. These are a fantastic way of working out what's going on underground, which is incredibly important in terms of that great imperative in our discipline, namely being able to, better able to predict an eruption. All right, this is where I grew up, Edinburgh in Scotland, a city built on seven hills, a little bit like Rome, except that's where the comparison ends. Um, if any of you have ever been there, you may note that it's not quite so warm. Um, it would be quite dangerous to eat the food. And uh, the people aren't quite so beautiful, present company accepted, of course. <laughs> now, these seven hills are all volcanoes in one shape or another, long since dead, especially this one. This is Arthur's Seat, a giant extinct volcano in the center of the city. I grew up looking at these and clambering over them and cycling around them, so it didn't take a huge amount of imagination to breathe all of this in and then eventually to come out the other side as a volcanologist. Now. One thing I've discovered during my decade in volcanology is that volcanoes reach out and touch us all in surprising ways. And I think some of you might remember a, a small event that happened last April involving a, an Icelandic eruption which you know, might just have had a little bit of an impact here in, in Germany. Um, that was an extraordinary example of volcanoes really taking us by surprise in respect of what, of what they can do. Um, perhaps you were stranded in a far off place. Even better, maybe your boss was stranded in a far off place with no internet connection. OK, so volcanoes reach out and touch us all. There are other ways in which volcanoes reach out and touch all of you Germans, some of which you may or may not be aware of. Uh, great big volcano in Germany, very important, Lacher See, last erupted 13,000 years ago or so. A really, really big explosion that might happen again, but you really don't want it to happen again. So I did a little bit of research to try and work out what might happen if this goes off again, as it may at some point in the future. So here we are, Germany. Here's the eruption. Let's switch it on. Huge, enormous ash column heading up into the upper atmosphere and dumping ash in the surrounding area. OK, I reckon by my calculations, this is the area that would really get it. Peter will be pleased to see that Belgium, in fact, doesn't escape the calamity. Um, look at all of these towns which are affected, Cologne, Frankfurt. Of course, down here in good old Bavaria, the good people of... <laughs> Whoops, actually, that was too much. Oh, no, no, it's not gone that far yet. The good people of Bavaria, I think, are safe. I'm going to have to take these off and then put this back on. OK, here we go. Right, so what might the fallout of this? If you're a football supporter, you might be quite interested. Think especially of Dortmund and Leverkusen, OK? Here's how the Bundesliga ended at the end of the last cycle. Now let's just throw the volcano in. That's what we want to see, OK? So. The, the football supporters here will now know what to pray for when they get home this evening. Right, other uh, relationships between Germany and volcanoes. It's another time and another world. But during the time of German East Africa, you had this, Kilimanjaro, probably the most famous extinct volcano in the world. First summit, first European up was a German, Hans Meyer. Also active volcanoes in that part of the world as well. Aldonio Elengai shown here erupting at the bottom. 
Now, this is a really unusual volcano. It erupts very odd lavas, which actually look a lot more like mud flows. But trust me, if you were to put your foot in one of these, you would regret it. Okay, so here we go. So these are lavas spraying out. Now, my students love watching these movies, but not as much as my three-year-old son loves all this. All sort of yucky and gooey, excellent kindergarten stuff. Right, so that's why volcanoes are important to Germans. What about why gases are important to all of us? What do they do? They pressurize within the volcanic conduit, within the magma. They create enormous pressures which drive these explosions. This was the last really big one, Pinatubo in 1991. I think you know who this is. Uh, here he is at the end of another victory, yon yon. And here goes the champagne bottle. It's the gas bubbles inside the champagne that cause the cork to pop out. A volcano is like a really, really big champagne bottle. Okay, basically, don't tell my students I said that. Right, what happens when a gas can get out of a volcano? You get something like this, not really very dangerous. What happens when a volcano has trapped wind? You get this, Mount St. Helens, huge explosion which went off in 1980. The Americans here will certainly remember that one. Right, so here we go. So then these gases get out into the atmosphere and they have all sorts of impacts there as well. They spread around the world. They get turned into tiny particles which enshroud the globe and turn into a kind of veil. Here is the veil. This is a shot taken from, from the space shuttle and they cool the atmosphere, they cool the planet as a consequence of that. So, for instance, following Pinatubo, the last really big eruption in 1991, there was global cooling for a few years thereafter which completely offset the global warming as a consequence of human activities from the Industrial Revolution, uh, revelation, Revolution up, until, up until that time, Freudian slip. Right, so, that's what volcanoes do to climate. Now, they can do all sorts of other things to climate as well. In 1883, Krakatoa goes off, sends these particles up into the atmosphere, creating eerie red sunrises and sunsets all across the globe, one of which was conveniently painted by Edvard Munch over Oslo Harbor in his great melancholy piece, The Scream. Earlier on during that century, in 1815, a much bigger eruption went off. Uh, um, Tambora, in, again in Indonesia. This caused the next year there basically to be no summer in Europe and North America, creating all sorts of problems in the process. A reminder of what it's like to live in Scotland most of the time, in fact. Now, during frivolity aside, or included perhaps, um, during this time, Lord Byron, the literary figure, was holidaying on the shores of Lake Geneva. The weather was so bad outside that no one was going to go outside and get sun, go sunbathing. Instead, they stayed inside. Everyone's mood was very morose, so he challenged his guests to a scary story writing competition, which is where Mary Shelley came up with the idea of Frankenstein. So, Frankenstein, in a sense, born of a volcanic eruption. What else do the gases do? Well, these particles, they make their way to the poles within the upper atmosphere and they get involved in all sorts of chemistry, which I won't kill you with the detail of right now. You'll be grateful to, to, to know. But look, here we are. Here's ozone in the Antarctic. It's going down all the time during the 80s because of these things, CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons. I think you remember them. Everyone is really quite frightened about this whole thing. Then all of a sudden, Pinatubo goes off, and the depletion becomes much, much greater than it had been even beforehand. So those things are, are really, really, really important. Okay, so gases are important. How do we measure them? Well, this is the basic approach. You go into the crater, you collect a gas sample, then you head back to the laboratory. Now, I don't think it takes a genius to realize the fundamental flaw with this. The volcano might erupt while you're trying to do this. Now, if you've got a very weak student who you'd like to conveniently dispose of, <laughs> you found your solution. But if life is something that you want to preserve and maintain in some sense, you might want to think about doing something else and not become a volcanic statistic. 
OK, so what else can we do? Uh, something that others and others have been involved in now for a few decades, and I've also been involved in too, are remote approaches to measuring on volcanoes. So here we are in Stromboli, fantastic explosive volcano in southern Italy, where you must go if you've not yet been. So what are we doing here? We're using telescopes coupled to all sorts of optical instrumentation. These are capturing light, which has basically gone through the volcanic gases, from the sun or maybe from the background sky, it gets absorbed partly within the gases, and uh, we do measurements of that. And that can tell us how much gas is coming out of the volcano and the chemical composition of those gases as well. Now, to sort of really reinforce why you want to do it this way rather than the go in the crater way, this is what Stromboli does every 10 minutes, okay? Pretty much like clockwork. So you don't really want to be there when this happens for, for obvious reasons. Okay, so what good are the gas measurements to us? How can they help us? Well, they tell us a lot about what's going on underground. They can help with forecasting too. Pinatubo in 1991. Here's the gas emission trace just before the eruption. Then suddenly there was this great big peak before the eruption. The authorities thought, right, quick, get everyone out. There was a huge evacuation of tens of thousands of people that certainly saved many, many lives. What about the end of an eruption? Here is, what, here is how uh, Mount St. Helens uh, redecorated its surroundings following that great eruption in 1980. Here are the gas emission measurements following on from the eruption. And you can see they're just slowly decreasing the time. This was really important in establishing that the volcano was switching off and that this was becoming a much safer place to be. So they tell us about their useful in respect to forecasting the key thing they help us do, though, is work out what's going on underground. Now, if you ask any primary school child, what's, what, what's a volcano? They'll say a mountain of fire and all sorts of stuff comes out of the top. Now, that's great. And we've heard all sorts of great things about primary school children, spaghetti and marshmallows. Good old primary school children. But what we want to know, the magic for us, is what's going on under here. The gases come from there. Therefore, they provide us insights into these underground processes. And a Japanese scientist coined this beautiful phrase that they're telegrams from the Earth's interior to provide us this knowledge. OK, so what do I do? What have I been involved in? I'm involved in development of hardware and software for making these measurements. Here's some of the stuff that we use, laptop, computer, and all sorts of gadgetry. Here is it deployed in action, Messiah Volcano in Nicaragua. I was a very young volcanologist, so my services were volunteered as the model for wearing the uh, strange prototype helmet, volcano uniform, costume, or whatever it is. Um, working on volcanoes has many, many surprising things. There's, there's getting the equipment to work. There's the volcano itself. Sometimes, though, your greatest issue is to do with all the children who come along, and they all want to know who these crazy people are and what on earth they're doing. Normally, they're quite straightforward to tackle, but just occasionally, you get the Dirty Harry style child. <laughs> so this little one here, bless his soul, wasn't really responding to my polite request that he didn't look down the telescope. So as I looked through the data stream that I collected on this day, there were all sorts of funny drop data points, which I realized were head points, where his annoying head had got into the way. So we have to contend with the little ones, bless them. There's also the small matter of explosions. They sort of tend to happen on volcanoes as well. This wasn't our car. I suspect its owner wasn't that pleased about the volcanic remodeling of his bonnet. And then what, just when you think it's safe and you can return home to your hotel room to have a well-earned night's sleep, you find you've got company. So working on volcanoes is never dull and boring. So we're involved in developing hardware and software for these applications. We're also involved in using uh, developing platforms that can carry them toward the volcano, uh, remotely controlled aircraft, for instance, um, in order to provide increased safety in this sense. What else are we doing? We're using ultraviolet cameras. These are just like the cameras in all your camera phones, except they don't see the visible part of the spectral region that we see with our eyes. Instead, they see ultraviolet light, which is absorbed by volcanic gases. These are deployed here on Mount Etna in Sicily. And you take these data and you process them, and you end up with something like this, a map of SO2, in this case, sulfur dioxide concentration across the field of view, which can give you a point-and-shoot assessment of how much gas the volcano is releasing. And this is being really useful in helping us, for instance, understand explosive processes occurring on Stromboli. 
All right, what else do we get up to? I talked to you before about this, these issues of volcanoes having climatic impacts. Now, it's really, really important that we have good sort of numbers for establishing how, to what extent this happens. The reason for which is we've got to understand natural perturbations to climate in order to be able to really, in detail, work out what human beings are doing, which is clearly going to be important in coming decades in terms of, um, of policies that, that come through in respect of that. The problem is that many of the big degassing volcanoes in the world aren't found in particularly convenient places, Papua New Guinea being one of them. Now, I had the great honor of spending uh, a year, uh, not a year, a, mon a month there, um, which I'm pleased to say I survived, tra traveling around via all sorts of interesting means, in particular going to this volcano here, Bagana. Now, this is one of the biggest degassing volcanoes in the world. But Bougainville, where it resides, has had a civil war, had had a civil war during the previous 10 years. So hardly anyone had worked there. So we've got to sort of work around all of those things as well. So it was an extraordinary visit, meeting all sorts of interesting people involving these guys, including these guys, who, trust me, are just as frightening as they look in the flesh. Right, okay, so back to the Icelandic eruption of last year, and with this I will wrap up the talk. So I think you probably remember this, this event, which will probably be impressed on all of our minds uh, for all sorts of different reasons that happened during last spring. Perhaps some of you were frustrated in an airport looking up at something like this. I gave you this image because, look, there's, there's Munich shown there. Some comedy arose from this. I don't know if you can read this. Iceland, where active volcanoes kick ash. There was a lot of ash jokes follow, following on from this. Ash and cash and all, all those sorts of things as well. I'm sure, I'm sure you remember the, all of those. Um, you remember that there was, uh, on, for a few days, barely a flight in the sky. This is the 17th of April, 2010. There's only a few commercial jet airliners in the sky at that point. Well, there was one aircraft in the sky over the United Kingdom, and that was a research aircraft trying to ascertain how, basically what the tolerance levels are in respect of ash impacting on engines, uh, on airplane engines, and also thinking about the, the chemistry of what goes on within these, within these plumes. So actually, from my point of view, it was a very serendipitous thing which had happened in terms of doing science. And we were able to, to pull out of that plots like this which basically show transects going through these plumes where we saw in the lower atmosphere, but something which we'd thought would occur. Oh, would occur. So, so if you like, if that, you like was that, that was our kind of slightly lining of, of this, of this out to coin a cliche. Right, so uh, thanks to new technology, we now know a lot more about volcanoes than this, but hope to know a lot more, and I just like it recorded, there's seven seconds on the clock, so. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.